Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Lord, we thank you for this time in your Word, and we pray now that you would use Pastor Izzy to speak to each one of us. Lord, you know where we're at in our walk with you. You know, we know where we're at in our walk in life here on this earth. And Lord, we just pray that you help us be heavenly minded. Lord, we just uh, thank you for your faithfulness that you care and you love about e- love each one of us. And we pray now that uh, you would have your way with us. You are the potter, Lord. We are the clay. So we just pray that you would you would uh, you would shape us and mold us and encourage us. And we ask that now in Jesus' name. We pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Okay, guys, why don't you turn in your Bibles to 1 John. Maybe we can get that paraglider guy to come down and listen to the message. But, um, yeah. Come on over. We're getting into the Word. So, um, well, guys, we're, we're to chapter 5 of 1 John this morning. And if you haven't been with us, John has been telling the, the audience here that he's writing to, this is to the believers, and he's giving them lots of things that they can know for certain. Um, a lot of times I notice believers struggle in their faith. They, they struggle with how do I know if this is really real? How do I know God's really there? How do I know that just all of these things that, um, you know, that their faith is struggling with? And by the way, when people ask questions like that, I never feel like, wow, that's a terrible question. Those are the best questions. You know, when someone says, I, are, are you sure this isn't a fable? I mean, are we really studying a real thing? And, and you know, there's things that sometimes we just need a little encouragement from the facts. You know, the Bible does not teach us to check our brain at the door when we go to church and, and just look for an emotional, heart-wrenching, moving experience. You are allowed to love the Lord, it says, with all your heart, But what's the second thing in the list with all your what? Your mind. And then with all your soul and all of your strength, all all the dimensions of your being are in this process that we call drawing near to God. With all of you. You know, there's a a problem if you only draw near to God with one part of you. You're not going to feel completed. The other parts will not get what they need. You know, you just, well, I'm an intellectual Christian. I don't. I don't believe in anything else. Well, okay, but, you know, he is the God of the heart, too. He's the God of the mind. He's the God of your spirit. Maybe your spirit feels weak. Maybe you just feel like, man, you've been getting kicked around. Anyone here going through any trials that you feel like, man, you've been a little bit punch, punch, uh, you know, like in the head from the the enemy just going, I'm just going to beat on you. Sometimes that happens to me. I'm just like, this morning, Jan's waking me up. Come on, honey, get up. It's 530. Why are you sleeping in? And I'm like, because she woke me up at 5 and 5.10 and 5.20, and that didn't work. By 5.30, it's 5.30! And she's been up since 4. So she's like, by now, she's like eager beaver going, you know, cooking away, doing the breakfast. And, and I'm just like, leave me alone. I don't even want to. My head is pounding. The rain has been pouring. And I have this weird built-in barometer in my joints from years of gymnastics. All my joints ache when it's about to rain. And then uh, if the rain starts up, it kind of loosens up a little. I can move my hand again. But then if it fades back down and kind of, as it starts and as it stops, I get severe pain. Just this evening, this, this, last night stunk. (laughs) Man, I couldn't sleep at all. I was like, what was up with that? The rain came, the rain went, rain came, the rain went, the rain, it wouldn't just stay on or off. I mean, it just kept going on and off, on, off, on. And see, if you don't have this problem, you're just laughing at me, you think it's fake. But I, I am the human barometer. I can tell you when the rain, within a minute, I can tell you because first it gets stiff, can't move the hand, it can't make a fist. I, I can push it in, but I have to like hold it with the other fingers to get it to close. And then when it gets that sharp needle like someone's knifing me between each joint, that means 30 seconds, kids, get your clothes out of the yard before the rain, you know, or get the towels off the rail, whatever, get everything. It's going to rain impending immediate. I mean, there's no guesswork. It it just happens so much now. I don't even, I just go, okay, God, that's a really weird gift. Does anyone else have this gift? 
where your body, your bones ache when you're, you know what I'm talking about? See, the knees. See, some people it's the knees, some people it's the hip joints, some people it's in their back, you know, they got an injury. And that little part that, that, that got injured, they can feel that part, you know, when that barometric pressure changes, it just makes that little, that little injury flare up. And these bodies are remarkable, God has put us in. But see, today I want to tell you, when we come to God, we're going to come to God with all of us, all of our being, our hearts, our minds, our soul, and that last thing is our what? Our strength, our body. And I'm, my wife's just, honey, get up, and I'm like, my body doesn't want to. <laughs> and I'm so tired, I slept horrible, I don't, I don't even want, I, can someone else do this? You know, this, I just, I don't want to do it, and, and the Lord knows. Thank God there's that verse in Isaiah, chapter 4, he says that, that if we wait upon the Lord, he renews our what? Our strength. You know, to, if it wasn't for that verse, I think there'd be some Sundays I'd have to ditch. <laughs> because I just lay there fighting going, God, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm hurting, man. I am waiting for you to do something quick because I know it's getting close. And, and the rain is still raining. And it made me have no motivation to get up. I'm like, I, we only live a mile away. So I can actually look out the window of our house and look down here. And I don't have to guess, is it raining here or not? If, it, if, it, if it's blurry and you can't really see the old airport, it's raining. We used to drive down and check. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> There's no need. Looking out, it's raining. Alfred comes at about 540. I hear his voice. What? Earlier, oh, I'm sorry, earlier, I was sleeping. <laughs> he did come earlier, that's right, the dogs were barking, I remember that. I was trying to ignore it, but it didn't work. But I could hear the rain, and Alfred's going, it's raining. <laughs> and then I hear Alfred's voice, Jan's like, no, no, it's going to be fine. And Alfred looks out, he's smart, he looks at the old airport. N it's raining down there too. <laughs> and when I heard that, I'm like, why should I get up? Church is going to be at the house. I'll get an extra half an hour. Just let me sleep. Please I'll hug my pillow. Has anyone ever just wanted to stay in bed? That extra 10 minutes, extra half. Please, I just want to stay here. I don't want to. I don't want to do it. Now you laugh, but you know, the reality is we have a God that says we can come to him. We just sang it this morning with confidence whenever we need grace and mercy to help us in our time of trouble. And sometimes our trouble's in our body. Sometimes it's a broken heart that needs mending. Sometimes we're just, <laughs> our brain is like muddled. We can't even think a straight. Anyone ever had a day where your mind just like, you you think I'm clouded up here, what's going on? Not, I can't, the thinker isn't thinking. It's not tracking well, you know. God, can God help us on all, the whole, every aspect of our being? Can he take care of, absolutely, right? And we're studying today something that John has said, listen, I was there with Jesus. He says, my hands touched him. My eyes saw him. My ears, I heard him. I, I, and he was the one that leaned on his chest there at the Last Supper, right against him. Can you imagine being that close to the Lord? Here it is, their last meal together. And John says, you know, <clears throat> I know who I'm talking about. I was, I'm the, and he said, I'm the disciple whom Jesus, what? Loved. loved. He, now we could all say we're the disciple whom Jesus loves, because does, doesn't Jesus love us all? You know, th this is one of those things I just pointed out last week, because some people tell me, oh, you know that Bible um, song we learned in Sunday school? Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, right? The Bible tells me, they go, it doesn't say that anywhere. And I, t I, I shared this last week, but where does it say Jesus loves us? Do you guys know this? In the Bible, where does it say, not God so loved the world. That's John 3.16. A lot of you default to that. That's, that's God loves us. John 17? Yeah, that would work. How about Revelation chapter 1? Tells us that Jesus, the revelation of Jesus, was sent to John. By the way, it's the same guy who we're reading that wrote... First, second, and third John also penned the, 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 the book of Revelation. And in that book, he says that he is the one who loves us, that Jesus is. And I go, oh, okay, let me just, um, 
let me just say, uh, this is a pretty good thing. He, he, when someone says, I don't think it says it anywhere, I'm like, just read the, read the last letter in the Bible, the last book, and you'll find out he loves you. But see, John knew this. And John even knew that some people struggled with this. They struggle with knowing that God really loves them. You know, when you, when you struggle with it, 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 can, it can have an effect on, on your faith. When you think, I don't know if, I, I think God loves the other people, the, the good people. Has anyone ever thought this? He probably loves the good people, not me. I'm not in the good group. And, 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 and that thing, God so loved the world, that just means like a grouping of the good ones of the world. Is that what it means? When he says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, who's he talking about? The whole world, right? Everyone. And it's not for us only that are good, because I wouldn't have been even included. It's the whole world, because we have a loving God. Now, John says this. In, 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 at the end of chapter 4, we read this verse to conclude last week, and this was his commandment that we have from him, that we should love God and we should love our brother, what? Also. Now, verse 1 of chapter 5, we pick up this morning. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whoever loves the Father, well, they love the child that is born of him. I mean, remember Jesus called the only begotten son. Who, whosoever believeth in him, God so loved the world, he gave his, what? Only begotten son. So who's the child born of God? Jesus. Now, by this, we know, we know that we have that, 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 the love, uh, that, that we love the children of God when we love God and we observe his commandments. And this is, he says, for this, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. His commandments, he says, are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who's overcome the world? He says, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. You want to be an overcomer? Start by putting your faith in Jesus. There's, you would never go wrong by putting it on the, on the one that God sent. You know, when, when Jesus was on the earth, they said to him, what works must we do to have everlasting life? What do we have to do? Some spiritual journey. We got to, you know, give to the temple. We got to, you know, go on missions. What, what do we have to do? And what was Jesus' answer? In, in John 7, he said, you must believe on him whom God has sent. What was he saying? Believe on me. This is the only work you have to do to have everlasting life. But if you read 1 John, you realize in 1 John 5, 5, that's the easy one to remember, 1 John 5, 5, that if you believe in Jesus, not only do you get everlasting life, but you get to overcome this world. And that's something that we have a lot of Christians. They, they signed up for Jesus. I call it for Jesus Christ mutual life insurance plan. You know, it's like, I don't want to burn in hell forever, so I'm going to sign me up. You know, I'm believing. I'm, I'm going to get my, my spiritual insurance policy in order here. I'm going to put my faith in him so I can have everlasting life. But what they don't understand, it's, a, it's, a, it's, not, it's not one of those, um, what's it called, net life? This is whole life policy. This is, Jesus said, I came to give you life and give it to you, what, more abundantly. And when you, when you sign up with Jesus, you're not just covered for e eternal life. What about the stuff you have to face in this life? See, 1 John 5, 5 says that you will overcome the world if you believe in Jesus. And this is something that, I don't know why, somebody forgot to read the policy details and put, you know, this is, don't you think you should highlight this one? I mean, if I was the salesman for the policy, I'd be like, look, don't just sign up so you get everlasting life. Sign up so that you can have life more abundant. And then in the abundant clause, under that paragraph, we get verse 5 here, that you get to become an overcomer. And there are so many things that hold us back that we need to overcome. Sometimes we're just struggling with an area in our life, a sin that has just, it's got like hooks in it. It just has caught us. And we can't seem to break free. And, and well, I was sharing this with one of the brothers this morning. Whenever my, my mom was a consummate alcoholic. And until, you know, one day she came home and she said to the whole family, I have become a, a Christian. 
We said, great for you, Mom. Now leave us alone. We, uh, she is, we, we weren't impressed. And she said, and Jesus is going to help me, and Jesus is going to help me overcome alcohol, and I'm not going to drink anymore. And I, listen, if you're the child of an alcoholic that has drank <laughs> their whole life, do, do you believe anything like this? I mean, how many times have you heard stuff like this? You know, I'm not going to drink this week. Yeah, right, until you yeah. get some money or until the alcohol shows up. The reason she wouldn't drink was when there was, there was nothing left in the cupboard. I'm not drinking this week. I'm swearing off drinking this week. Yeah, that's because you drank it all. <laughs> but when a friend showed up with a f couple six-packs, yeah, it's on. All of a sudden, what was, I'm not going to do it, is all of a sudden, well, that was last week, or that was earlier. Or It's funny how time warps for an alcoholic. <laughs> they are sure they said that a week ago, but it was yesterday. Twisting that happens. And when you're the child of this, you just get to where you just... Look, uh, it's hard to believe anything that they say. So she came on saying, I'm born again. I'm a new creature. Jesus has changed me. And we're like, yeah, mom, a new trip. Believe it when I see it. And you know what? This is the part that I want to tell you. The Bible says, if anyone calls on the name of the Lord, you're ever in trouble, call on the name of the Lord, and it says, and you shall be what? Saved. You're in, you're in, a, you're in a trouble, you call on him, he says he'll save you. But not too many preachers are telling the people, don't forget, even the old Christians need to remember this, right? I mean, and anyone here been in Christ over 10 years? Raise your hand. Oh, I'm preaching to the choir here. <laughs> Do even older Christians need to remember to call on the Lord when we get in trouble? Especially. <laughs> I like that. Especially. Because as you get older in the Lord, the devil, he, he goes, I can't trip him up with those little simple things I used to. So he gets more crafty. And he plots things. And, and sometimes some of the snares he's setting, he isn't just, you know, it's not like just the little quick, trap it he works it out and lays out the thing and he's looking to get you but we can't veer from what we're, what the thing what we first learned i'm sure many of you learned this early on in your faith that if you just call on the lord no matter what you're facing call on the lord when i was a new christian this seemed like good that's good they, they, they said call on jesus and you you not might be saved you shall be saved and i was like okay and every time a temptation came, every time there was a problem, I was like, Lord, I need help. And I, I realized I was really quick to call on the Lord, which made the Lord really quick to come to my rescue. But see, as we get older, we think, I can handle this. I don't need to bother God on this. I can, <clears throat> I'll do this one on my own. How's that work out for you anyway? <laughs> wah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work. Man, do not go there. You've got to remember, this whole life policy says you can be an overcomer if you believe in Jesus. But you've got to remember who you've got to call. You get in trouble, who are you going to call? It's not Ghostbusters. <laughs> it's Jesus. You get in trouble, you've got to be like, Jesus, I need you. And everyone who believes in Jesus, the Son of God, it says he will be one who overcomes the world. This is, this is one of the best perks of this eternal life policy we got because this helps us deal with this world down here. Now, we've studied that, you know, in John 17, the true Lord's Prayer, Jesus is praying for the believers, for us. He says, Father, I pray for these guys, not that you take them out of the world, which I have often wanted him to do, especially when things are bad. Lord, just get me out of here. And he goes, nope. Because when, when Jesus prays for the church, he says in verse 15, this is John 17, not First John, back to the gospel of John. John chapter 17, verse 15, he says, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. That means set them apart in truth. He says, your word is truth. And as you sent me into the world, I also send them 
into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves might also be sanctified in truth. Now I do not ask on behalf of these alone, he said, but for those also who believe in me through their word. That's us, down line. I'm praying for all the ones who will believe in me because of their word, what they would share. That they all might be one, he said, even as you, are, you the Father, uh, and I in me, I in you, they also might be in us so that the world might believe that you sent me. This is Jesus' true high priestly prayer. Some of you might have a little thing at the top where it says this is his priestly prayer for the church. I call it the true Lord's Prayer because the other thing what we call the Lord's Prayer, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, that was actually our prayer. That's the one that Jesus said, they said teach us how to pray and he said pray in this way. He was giving them instructions how they should pray, how we should pray. That's our prayer. But you want to know what his true prayer is? Read John 17. Father, I don't ask you to take them out of this world. I ask you to keep them from the evil one. If you didn't know this, I've used this example before. I even We made it into one of the devotionals on the words of encouragement. You were created to be in this world. It's not a problem with you being in the world. You, you're like a boat. A boat is created to be in the water. There's no problem with a boat being in the water. Do I have any boats behind me? Oh, just a little canoe. That's Well, it'll work. Oh, no, there's one over there. I need, I'm a visual learner, so, you know. Example, over there, boat. See the boat? No problem for that boat to be in the water. What would be the problem is if the wa too much of that water gets in what? In the boat. And if it should happen that water gets in that boat, we have this little device in the back of a boat and the lower gunnel it's it's called a bilge pump just a little pump you flip on and it sucks up the water and pumps it out so that because you know sometimes water splashes into the boat and it works this way down it. now if you don't turn on the bilge pump what's going to happen eventually you're going to sink the boat and see it's just like us as christians we're in this world but if we let too much of this world splash into us what happens to us we sink we got to flip on the bilge pump and purge that stuff, get it out. We need the world stuff out of us because Jesus didn't say, I don't, you're, you're not made for this world. You're made to be in, you're, you might be the only light to one of your friends of the gospel. They may never read the Bible. You're the, your life is their only Bible they ever read. You're like the rescue boat. You're, you're like the spiritual rescue boat sent to help them learn about salvation. But if you let too much of this world into you, you start sinking. And believe me, the devil loves to get Christians to compromise and not be overcomers because of their faith because then their boat's, well, it's lame. It's like going down. It can't save anyone else. It can't even float its own boat. It's going nowhere. This is what happens to Christians that compromise. They don't go anywhere. They don't overcome. And if you don't know this, unbelievers are watching you. Isn't it amazing how they know what we're supposed to do? Yeah. They don't even go to church like, you're a Christian, aren't you? And you're like, yeah. You're not supposed to do that. I'm pretty sure that's not in your book. And they know what we're supposed to do and not do. Why? Because they know. God has given us... His spirit, it says, that convicts the world concerning sin. We don't ever have to convict someone about sin. I don't know about you, but when I went to church early on, I didn't need the preacher to tell me that I was a sinner. That was a given. I needed him to tell me what to do about it. How do I fix it? Don't tell me I'm a sinner. I already know I'm a sinner. How do I get freed from the sin? That's what... Because God's Spirit already did the job of convicting all of us that we have sin. In whatever area we sin in, God's Spirit, it says, it's His role to convict us. And by the way, when He convicts, it's different than condemnation. I've shared this before, but even though they both start with a C, and they both point out that you have sin, they have two different origins and two different destinations. Conviction comes from the Holy Ghost above. And it points out to us, you, you're doing that wrong. You need to stop. Now, why does God's Spirit convict me of sin? What's He trying to do? He's trying to turn me from it, and He's trying to help me overcome that. He's trying to free me from that and set me free. Because 
who the Son has set free is what? Free indeed. But see, the devil, it says, comes and condemns us. All, all night, all day, he stands before the throne of God in the book of Revelation, and he points out, did you see Izzy? Look, he's a sinner. He wants to sleep in today. He doesn't even want to preach. Loser. And he wants to condemn us. And if we listen to that voice that points out our weaknesses, that points out our shortcomings, it will drive us away from what God has for us. Because it has, even though it points out the same flaw, it does it with a different spirit. You know, there's a totally different spirit. when you, Some of you have friends who c really care about you. And, you're, and maybe you're struggling in an area, and, and they're, f they're for you. I mean, when you're struggling, they're like, you can do it. Hang in there. You know, you can make it. They see your flaw, but they don't condemn you for it. They're, they're, they're just there to lift you up, right? And that's what God's spirit does. He convicts me of it, says that's not right, but, but I believe in you. I know you can go. Just hang on to my son. Let's get through this. And he gets you through. But the devil comes along and goes, yeah, you blew it. In fact, I don't think you should be in the club because you're pretty bad. You're not even worthy of the club. Why don't you quit going? Anyone ever heard that voice? You shouldn't even bother being at church, man. You, you're a disgrace to the rest. Nobody's, they all know you're sinning. And the devil tries to drive you away from God so that you won't get that strength to overcome. So he can make you stumble. So he can make you fall. You know, the Bible says he's look. He's like a, it says he goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he might what? Devour. He's a creep. By the way, he's the only guy I can in all clear conscience say go to hell. <laughs> and I mean it. Buzz off, <laughs> you jerk. He's out condemning everyone. We do not need his influence. We need God's spirit. And we need to, we need to know we can call on him any time, any time that we want, and he'll be there to save us. Now listen to this. Verse 6 says, This is the one who came by the water and the blood, Jesus Christ, not with water only, but with water and with blood. And it is the spirit who testifies because it says the spirit is the spirit of truth. Now these three, he says, testify together. What three? It says right here, it says the spirit, the water, and the blood. The three are in agreement. Now you're probably going, what is that about? But let me just read a little further. It, 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 don't ever do this. You read and you go, I don't get that perplexity. Hmm. Don't get that. I don't understand, Lord. I think I'll quit. <laughs> By the way, don't... that. The Bible is set up so you have to, it, per, it, it pricks your curiosity. What is that? But you just got to keep reading. Sometimes the answer is right a couple verses down, but you, you know, some people, I don't know why they quit, and then they call the pastor. <laughs> pastor, I don't get this. Did you read the whole text? No. I stopped when I didn't understand something. Well, dude, if I did that, I would never have gone through the page, you know. I mean, there's always something I don't, I'm constantly learning. Constantly going, God, I don't understand. What about this? What about this? Just keep reading. It's funny how some of the answers are just right there coming up. Now, some of the answers you don't get right away on that page. Maybe you're going to read another portion of Scripture, and, and there will be the answer. You know, And it's amazing how sometimes some of the answers just take um, maybe a little bit back up a little. Maybe the, he was setting this up, and you just didn't spot it. So you back up a few pages and read it again. You know, we're spiritually lazy as a culture. I'm sorry to say. We, we, we've gotten too used to Siri. What's the answer? <laughs> Google. I want to know this. You know, and, and for some reason, the whole seeking to know things is, has been, uh, how do you say it? Like, there's no attention span anymore. Nobody really wants to try to learn. They just give it to me quick. Fast, make the message shorter, Pastor. Short, sweet, to the point, and let's and and, and and you know, just do another short, sweet one later. I'm I'm blown away because you know, in other cultures, they go to church for the entire day. They have different men that get up 
and share words about the Lord. And, and, and they have women gifted in the gift of prophecy called prophetess that will speak marvelous things of the Lord. You know, thus saith the Lord, not, not the lady. The Lord just speaking through her, his spirit, speaking. To, maybe someone's really struggling. And they came going, God, I need you to tell me this specific area I'm struggling. And boy, isn't it sweet when God's spirit has somebody gifted with that gift and they just go, oh, the Lord wants you to know. He's with you. All you got to do is do this and this and this. And you're like, yes, God is. I mean, I get chicken skin when I think about how the Holy Ghost hears what we're praying for and answers in such marvelous ways. But in the American church, we're more like um, fast food drive-in kind of spiritual experience. Pull up. Give me the food. Quick, eat it. Drive on. And, and, and we can't even stop to eat it. We got to drive and eat at the same time. You know, because we, we wouldn't want to possibly sit down and actually enjoy the meal. This is m mind boggling to me because growing up Italian, we had dinners that lasted for hours. You know, five, six courses, seven course meals. That was, that was, that was supper. You just sit at the table, you eat. They take that course away, you talk, you play some cards, another course comes, you know, you do this. And it can last three, three, four hours. Now, my friends were just in shock. They didn't know how to sit at a table and enjoy other people. They didn't know. Th my son says, Dad, the art of conversation is dead. <laughs> he watches his sisters in the van. We have the little Honda van out there. And one will be in the second seat and one is in the third seat and... And, and instead of talking to each other across the seat, you know what the girls do? <laughs> Text, Snapchat. I know, because I can see them in the rearview mirror. <laughs> and then, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and then they're holding up their phone to show each other, but they don't talk. And Daniel's like, I can't stand it. They don't know how to talk anymore. Nobody knows how to just sit at a table and have a conversation. My generation, he's talking about his generation. My generation, we do this all the time. It's how you got to know people. It's how you got to be there for other people. It's how you supported each other. I mean, sometimes you just, you can't just talk about the deep things right off the bat sometimes. You need a little food, a little bit of time, maybe a couple desserts, you know, edge into it. Maybe there's something really serious that you're struggling with and you're just not ready to just pour it out on the table, right? Just quick, eat. Tell me the big heavy thing. No. You know, we were made uniquely made by God where he knows what we need and to take a little time to just look at what he says in his word is really good for our spirit our spirit it needs that spiritual meal sometimes I wish I could just serve you like seven eight course spiritual meal instead of this quickie that we have to do here in American culture you know it, it, I love when, when other cultures say well we want you to come and preach all day we come and share all day. I mean, what do you mean all day? Like, like all day. Could you just talk, talk about Jesus? Oh, tell us everything. They don't, they're not, don't just tell us one little part. Tell us as much as you, much as you want to tell us. Tell us. We want to know about God. Now, the Bible says anyone who hungers and thirsts after righteousness. What does the Bible say? Well, Jesus said this. They shall be what? Filled. I love it when you have those people hungry to know the word. Remember when I first met Dylan, he was like, can I ask you a couple questions? I'm like, sure. Whips out his phone, scrolls down the list. <laughs> Let's start with this one. I didn't know there's like 30 questions on the list. <laughs> and I didn't know, you know, after about five and it's gone a couple hours in depth, could, could I ask you another one? And he, he kept doing it. I'm like, how many you have on there? Only 35, but I keep adding. I mean, I'll answer one, and while I'm answering, he's typing another one on there. <laughs> oh, that gives me another question. Let me write that in there. He still does it. <laughs> but I remember staying up with him until like 1, 2 in the morning on Saturday night. After I was like, look, son, I can't do this. i got to preach on Sunday. you got to pay another night to stay up all night answering these Bible. But it's great to have someone who hungers to know about the Lord because there are such satisfying things for your spiritual walk. For the things that you need to overcome that you can't always just address them in a real quick message. Some of the things are subtle that you have to learn about your faith. 
sometimes there's like subtle things that, here's one that was pointed out to me, and I'm sure some of you have heard this before. On the day when you feel the least like going to church, okay, you're struggling with some sin, you don't, you, you're like me this morning, I just want to stay in bed. I, I was just exhausted and in pain. But I did not want to come. On the day when you're the least feeling like going to be with other believers, maybe you're struggling in an area of sin, you think, I, I don't want to be around them. They're just going to condemn me or, or they're going to find out or I don't know what's going to... You know, the devil's whispering one thing in your ear and your, your brain's spinning its wheels and, and you're not really thinking clearly. What should you do on that day? That's the day you... This is what was taught to me. The day that you feel the least like going is the day you need to go the most. That's how the preacher put it. You know, that's a subtle thing to say, but there is days in our Christian faith where we're slipping and we feel the least like going and being with other believers. But it, it, in true assessment of our spiritual walk, is that the day we really need to be there the most? And, and by the way, it's so ironic because some people tell me, Pastor, I really wasn't going to come today. Everything was going wrong. The car wouldn't start. The kids were flipping out. Da, 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 da. And, and, the, and then the salesman called, and then it was another wrong number. And I just, I just, you don't understand everything that kept me from coming. I just thought, I, I don't even need to go. And then I get here, and you preach that message, and, and how did you know? And, and, and God spoke directly to me, and I'm like, good. Because there are days when we feel like quitting and God's going, get over there. That's the day when you need it the most. And sometimes we are so self-centered that we're thinking, I, all right, I'll go. He's probably going to tell me something I need. But what if he just wants to use you to tell someone else something they need? By the way, Paul the Apostle says this when he writes to one of the churches in the, in the pastoral, his Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, those ones. He says, I can't wait to come be with you guys so that when I get to be with you, I'll be able to encourage you. You're like, what? Yeah, you said, I can't wait to get there to encourage you. Do you guys know why he said that? What did he say next? And that in so doing, that I encourage you, when I get to go encourage Holland, while I'm being used of God to encourage, God's Spirit's just pouring through me to encourage him. What did Paul say would happen to him as he was just being used to encourage others? He said, and I too there will be encouraged. See, whenever you're used to encourage someone else, whether you like it or not, there is a residual encouragement flow. Goes through you to them, but it can't pass through you without doing what to you? Lifting you up. And sometimes you need that lift, but you're thinking all about you. And God's going, I'm going to, Kate, I got you, I got you. But not the way you think I got you. I'm sending you there so you'll be an encouragement to that other person. And then, while you're being used to encourage, maybe they just need a hug. Maybe they just need someone to say, man, I'm glad you're here. It's, it's good to see you. And you're thinking, oh, I needed that. And they needed it too. Because it is impossible to do any of the gifts of the Spirit to be used in any capacity, whether you're speaking a word of encouragement, whether you're speaking a word of, uh, of exhortation, or a, 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 a word of teaching, preaching, whether you're just there and given a hug. In the love of God, you don't realize that God is going to encourage you when you get used to help others. And it's a beautiful thing. It is one of the best things. I know on some of the days when I'm the most tired at the end, I'm like, wow, Lord, I feel really good. Didn't get any sleep last night, but I, it's amazing what you can do. And I've already learned when I'm weak, what's the Bible say? Then I am what? Then I am strong. But not because it's my strength. Who, do, who am I learning to lean on? On the Lord. This is where you become an overcomer. When you learn to lean on the guy who you were meant to lean on. Some of you are experiencing some real bad relationship problems because you've leaned on the wrong person. Instead of leaning on the Lord, you've leaned on human flesh that, that wasn't the one you were supposed to be leaning on. And because of it, it's caused you pain. 
And you're wondering, why do I have this pain? Because you got, the Bible says, don't put any confidence in the flesh. Whether it's the flesh of your own flesh, that's a big danger for most of the guys. None of you girls, you're all so godly. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it is pretty much a guy predominant problem. It's pride. But girls, some of them have pride too. And they like to lean on their own flesh or the flesh of others. The Bible calls it the arm of flesh. We want the arm of flesh to deliver us from our troubles instead of the arm of the Lord. And I've learned after fighting a few spiritual battles, the arm of flesh can't fight in the spirit. It never wins. It's only the arm of the Lord that wins. So I want to teach you, go to him. Get in trouble this week, who are you going to call on? Jesus. He's the one that overcame. And let me just finish this part of the chapter so I can close. Well, no, I'm, I'm going to go to verse 12, and that's it for this week. He says, we received this testimony. And uh, he says in verse 9, if we receive the testimony of men, he says the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his son. The one who believes in the son of God has, has the testimony in himself. He says the one who does not believe in God has made him a liar. Because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. Now this, this is the testimony, guys. Verse 11. That God has given us eternal life and the life is in who? In his son. He who has the son, verse 12 says, has the life. He who, what does it say? Does not have the son? Does not have the life. Now, I have had people, any of you run into people say, yeah, I believe in God, but I don't believe in Jesus. I don't know how to tell you this. It's a package deal. <laughs> and I didn't set up the package, okay? And if you don't like it, don't take it up with me. Take it up with him. You ain't going to win. But go ahead, try. You know, why don't preachers do that anyway? What, are they afraid God can't fight this battle? You know, some guy comes to me and he says, I only believe in Jehovah. I don't believe in Jehovah Shua, which, by the way, that's Jesus' name in Hebrew, or contracted as Yahshua, which means the name of the Lord, Jehovah, his name, the Lord, and Shua is in Hebrew salvation, the Lord's salvation. Jesus' name literally means God's salvation. Such a mysterious thing, don't you think? Hmm. What's your name? God's salvation. <laughs> that's kind of tricky. What are you here to do? Uh, well, let's see. I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to, well, you guess. <laughs> Save it. That's right. Yeah. Because his name means God's salvation. It wasn't even cryptic. It was like straight in your face. That's literally the name of Jesus. Another name he's called from his birth is Emmanuel. Anyone can tell me what Emmanuel means? God with us. How many of your friends have ever asked you, if God is real, why doesn't he just come down here and show himself? And what's the answer? He did already. Good question. You weren't paying attention in class of history, were you? <laughs> he did. He's been with us. He came so that and it, he who has the son, it says, has the life. But this package deal is not one of those things you can pick and choose what you want. Well, I'll take the father, but I don't want the son. Because it says here, if you don't take the son, you don't get the life. I'm sorry, I didn't make the rules. If you're mad at me for this, you need to take it to upstairs. Take it to the guy, complain to him. It's his fault. Give it to him. I, I, I challenge you to. And don't call me with hate mail. <laughs> you know, don't, don't get it all over my case. I didn't say it. It's right here. You can read it in this translation. You can pick a different translation. Guess what? It says the same thing. I've read it in multiple languages. It's the same in Hebrew. It's the same in Greek. Same in my Italian Bible. It's even in my Spanish Bible. It's the same thing. I, I study many languages. It doesn't bother me. In fact, I, I was like, let me just look this one up. King James, New King James, NIV, NASB, NASB. I have a whole bunch of other language versions. So I'm reading them. They all read the same exact thing. You can't even get around this verse no matter what you want to do. 
It just flat out says, he who has the Son has the life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. This is the only way. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, not a way. I am the truth, not a truth. And I am the life. And no man comes to the Father except through who? Me, he says. You got to come. You want to get to God, you have to come through me. I am the door to the sheepfold. Anyone who tries to get into the sheepfold another way, he says he's a thief and a robber. You want to get through, you got to go through the shepherd. The good shepherd. He, he's the door. By the way, they didn't have doors on their sheep pens. You know what? They had an opening about six feet wide. And do you know who the door was? The shepherd. Because once the sheep were in the pen, guess where the shepherd laid down? Crossed the opening right there and said, you want to get to my sheep, you got to go through me. He was picking something, by the way, that they totally understood back then. This wasn't like, you know, oh, wow, this is cryptic. He, when he was saying, I am the door to the sheepfold. You got to come through me. I'm the good shepherd. Anyone hear my voice? All, he says, all my sheep, they know my voice. They know. He calls them. Hey, come follow me. And you know, you know when God has called to you. Some, some people, God's calling to them, but they're resisting. Like, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Go. What, what, do you, what do you have to lose? Let me see. Everlasting life. You miss out on overcoming. Actually, you're losing out on a lot. You should heed that voice. If you have not heeded that voice, if you heard that God's spirit has been calling to you, come. Come to me. The Bible says, Jesus said, come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you what? Rest for your soul. Some of you, your souls need rest. And all you got to do is come. Jesus, come. You can drink freely. I'll give you to drink of living water. You'll thirst no more. He'll quench your spirit. But you got to come. And I can't make you, but I wish I could. If I could, if I could just make everybody get in the sheepfold, I would. <laughs> I mean, I just, not to be mean, just because I know it would hurry the things along, you know, like, let's get, to get, get in. You're missing out. Besides, you're a jerk without him, you know. Some of you are jerks with him, but you're work, you work in progress. Like me. We're all just works in progress, right? You understand that. None of us is already arrived yet. I won't arrive till I see him face to face. But next week, I got something for you that's going to really encourage you. The, the, the last part of this chapter. Now, I'll go back to the blood, the water thing, and the spirit. I promise. We'll, we'll just, but I need to finish out a little bit more in the chapter. And, uh, and then I'll go back maybe all the way to the first book of the Bible to show you something. We already studied it, by the way. It's the Cain and Abel story. You want to read ahead, just read it and look for blood and water, spirit kind of stuff in that chapter. See if you notice anything. See if any of those three things testify or speak in the story. Things what we don't think of speaking. We already know the spirit speaks. But can God have blood speak? Do you remember the story, Cain and Abel? Genesis 4, he says, What's, w w what is this? Um, I hear the voice of your brother's blood. Crying out, right? Crying out. You, what would you do to him? Now, did God not know what he did? Sure he knew. But it was pointed out to him. You know, why, why is it that it's okay for forensic evidence to say, yes, there's been a crime. We have the blood right here shining the little light, see? But we can't accept that God could have better forensic skills than, than man. What, he didn't have the, the light to shine? He is light. God is light. He probably just went like that and went, oh, I see it. No extra bulbs necessary. Just, yep, there's the blood. But something he says that the blood did is it cried out to him. When Jesus walked this earth, do you remember when they were, they were crying Hosanna, Hosanna, and putting the palm branches down? And the Pharisee said, you need to tell your disciples to be quiet. And Jesus said, if these would be quiet, something else would cry out. What did he say? The very stones, the very rocks would cry. I always joke, that'll be a real rock concert. <laughs> I mean, really? Can you just dig it? All the, there's a lot of rocks in Jerusalem. We have a lot of rocks in Hawaii, but they have these gold ones. And they'd be just screaming. Come 
Messiah, Messiah, Hosanna. What a trip that would be. Now, can God really make rocks to cry out? Can he really hear the, the voice of uh, 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 when Cain killed his brother Abel? Could he hear, hear Abel's blood? Yes. And here in this story, he says these three agree. The water, the blood. What blood do you think he's talking about? Whose blood? Blood of Jesus. By the way, we got all those hymns. What can wash away my sin? What's the answer? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There's nothing but his blood that can get rid of my sin. But there's the water thing. I'll get back to that in the spirit. And God says all three of those testify of this fact, that you need the son. Don't forget that this week. You get in trouble, who are you going to call? Jesus. You have somebody that's in trouble spiritually, tell them, call on the Lord. Call on the name of the Lord. You, you, maybe you're fighting temptation. Whenever you feel that temptation coming on, just go, Jesus, save me. And anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, it says, shall be saved. Now, I know some people just use that in the context of gaining everlasting life. I think they're missing out on the whole overcoming clause. 1 John 5, 5. You overcome because you still keep calling. You didn't just call on him for salvation. You called on him for deliverance from whatever you're facing this week. Just keep calling on him. And when you do that, he'll save you. Don't forget it. Don't care how old you are in the Lord. This still works. For me, it's been 35 years. Still works. Hasn't stopped working. In fact, I submit to you, it's more important I do it now than ever. Isn't it? i got to walk in that. Let's pray. Lord, thanks for so much for your word. Thank you for all these believers around here, Lord. Such a privilege to share with so many that have been in the faith for so long a time. Lord, I pray that as we go from here, these, these things, what we have looked at, Lord, these things would just, well, they'd be buried into our being in a way that could be recalled at a moment's notice, Lord, whenever the need might arise that we need to call on your, on your son's name, that we would be those people, that we wouldn't rely on our own flesh, we wouldn't rely on our own strength, but we would just look to you to deliver us, Lord. Please, we ask for anyone who's struggling, our brothers and sisters here, perhaps they're, f they're fighting addictions or strongholds that have held them back, Lord, we ask for on their behalf, you feel together with them that you would deliver. Set free, Lord, the captives. And anyone who doesn't know your son, we pray that today would be a day that they would learn to call on him, that they could experience what we're talking about, that they could have salvation imparted to their soul. We ask that now in Jesus' name. Everyone that agree with me said? Amen. Amen. If you haven't called on the name of the Lord, all you Christians that raise your hand 10 years in, in the Lord or more, raise your hand again. Okay, if you have not experienced what I'm talking about, raise your hands, hold it up, you guys, hold it, talk to any one of these guys. I'm tired. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.